Genesis 15. I'm going to have to go back a little bit. Find out where my there it is. Genesis chapter 15. If you would turn there. Good to have you with us this afternoon. Good to be in God's house. Good to have God with us. Amen. Never left us. He's never going to forsake us. He didn't say that every day would be easy. But he said he'd be with us every day and never would leave us. And I tell you what, I I don't even want to think about where I would be right now if it wasn't for God interfering, intervening in my life, putting a stop to me, making me quit, making me do things. Boy, I'd keep thinking of Brother Doyle Lawson, uh, Doyle Lawson, Doyle Williamson, uh, and that message he preached. And he said it right. God hates your flesh. God is an enemy to your flesh and always will be. Your flesh is not ever, ever leaving this, this earth. All it is is rot and corruption for the seed that's inside of it. And uh, I just kind of noticed that my dad was real good, Gary, about composting. And he learned it from his mom and dad. His mom and dad, they knew they did gardening very well. My meemaw won a, a, a spot in the newspaper back in the 50s for having the prettiest lawn in Jacksonville, Arkansas. And I mean, it was gorgeous back then. She worked hard at it. So they gave her a spot in the newspaper and, and she worked hard at it. But they, they knew about composting and anything. We didn't have a garbage disposal in our house. Everything that was left over got scraped off in a bowl. Mike, take this down, put it in the compost pile. All that rot, corruption, everything like that. Uh, Dad saw the... Um, electric power line workers going down the going down the road cutting off branches that were growing close to and he asked them what are you going to do with all that stuff and i don't know what they told him but i he must have slipped them some money or something like that he said dump that in my yard my boy will move that and i'm going i will <laughs> i mean i mean it was a big pile too and i remember i went running to him one day i said dad that thing's almost on fire he said, yeah. Why is that? I said, he said, well, that's part of the composting. All that stuff in there, with the, when the water hits it, it starts corrupting and rotting. And all that bacteria in there is letting off all that, all that heat. And that's what's doing it. And that just fascinated me. I didn't know anything about that. But anyway, he always knew how to garden real well and, and uh, knew, the, knew the benefit of having a lot of corruption in your compost pile. The worse it stank, the better it was. And when he found out there was a man down the street, Roy, that was selling cow manure out of his barn, guess what we did one Saturday? Shoveled manure out of a barn. Do what? Yeah, hogs make good compost too. Or, yeah, hogs, whatever hogs do. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, turn there. So all that corruption in your life, that serves a purpose. That's, that's God finding good ground to sow some good seed on. Amen. Genesis chapter 15. Been a little while, so let's kind of run through this. Uh, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, uh, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. We are that seed born of Christ, born of Abraham by faith. 
So we are, we possess now the blessings of Abraham because we are of his seed born again. Even though we're not Jews, we are born again of that new seed that God put in us. Verse 6, one of the most important verses in your Bible, underline it, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's what I preached this morning. And I've since I've been putting out this Watchman broadcast, which I think is uploaded now, on tribulation, um, a lot of these hyper dispensationalists are coming out after me. They've been doing it for years. I'm used to it. I've had to run people out of our Facebook group who were like that because they were spreading their false gospel poison in amongst the group. And I just don't allow that. I, I'm not going to be nice about it either. They say that Anybody in the Old Testament, nobody in the Old Testament was saved by grace through faith, believing in the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And that's a lie. You look at that verse right there. How did Abram get saved? He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And to say that Abram knew nothing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he lived it. When he offered Isaac, his only son, on the altar, he was himself was a foreshadow of Christ's offering. And it was in the same spot, too, Mount Moriah. Same place, north of Jerusalem. That's where he did it. And these people, they don't know how to handle that, so that's when they start calling me names. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me... And heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And Abram, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed, and this is where we're going tonight, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now, um, the last... I don't think I did this last Sunday night. I think I continued on the message from the morning on salvation. But I want you to look at that phrase, they shall afflict them 400 years. We know the number four is a number related to the spiritual realm. We know it is related to the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Christ's death, burial, resurrection is in there. And you're looking at a, a prototype of the gospel. Now, some people always want to know, because they've heard so much of TBN and false ministries on television, false ministries on the internet, that are telling people that if they're really saved, they will never suffer, they will never have want of anything, and they will never have any disease. They will never be, they will be without sin. And that's what gets me. Is these million dollar preachers on TV who make you think their life is sinless. And let me tell you what the Bible says about them. I don't even, I don't have to know what they do in their private lives. The Bible already tells me. Number one, the Bible tells me that their eyes are full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. Most of these guys are probably very deep inside corruption. Those who present themselves as some form of sin-free person. Uh, and let me say this, and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not saying this in a chastising way because I want you to pray for him. Y'all, many of you know the Duggar family. 
Uh, they were made famous because of the number of kids that they have, believing that God told them that that's how their family was to be, and I don't have a problem with that. And they homeschooled their children, kept them away from the things of the world. But don't misunderstand or underestimate the power of the devil to get a hold. If you remember several years ago, the oldest son, Josh Duggar, there was controversy because it came out that he had messed with a couple of his sisters. And then it came out that he had been caught participating in these sex dating websites. He was caught red-handed. And this came after he had spoken in churches and pastors stood him up and said, this is a godly man. He lives a godly life and he's a godly example to all of our young people. And none of it was true. And what he's facing right now is probably 10 to 40 years in federal prison on child pornography charges. And he is a very, very messed up young man. And I'm sure his family is grieving for him. But do not think that you can isolate yourself from the reach of sin because it's not possible. The devil will find a way. He will find a stronghold, build it in your life. And I should probably teach on that one of these days again, too. I've taught on it before and probably do it again. But the devil will build a stronghold in your life. It's like having a, it's like having a wall in your house that's full of bees. And if you don't get them out, you're going to have trouble. And that fits into what we're going to talk about tonight. The affliction of the saints. Because he said, um, back here, verse, oh, let's see here. I went past it. Anyway, back here in, in Genesis 15, he said, Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so on and so on. So I want to talk again. I mentioned it uh, a couple of Sunday nights ago. I was talking about the affliction of the saints. You know, that God does see our affliction. And I know I taught about that. How the vagus nerve reaches down from the head and it touches your bowels. And that's what Job was talking about. My bowels boiled and rested not. The days of, of affliction prevented me. But tonight we're going to look some more into the afflictions of a Christian's life. Is it possible that a born-again, Bible-believing Christian can live a life that is free of affliction. It's not possible. In fact, it's not even really the will of God. If you read this Bible and read it right, uh, in fact, I would just tell you to read 1 Peter. And 1 Peter will tell you that, yes, you are going to be tried. You are going to suffer. You're going to, you're going to have pain in your life. You're going to have afflictions in your life. You're going to have devils chase you and haunt you and try to put you in fear and try to tempt you to go back into sins that you're trying to leave out of. And those are all part of the afflictions. We'll study that tonight. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. and We do thank you for it. And Father, help us to understand, God, it's not that you hate us. It's not that you're angry at us. Father, Lord, this is part of the life that you've given us to leave. We know, Father, that our enemy is strong. And outside of the help of Jesus Christ, who is the greater in us than he that is in the world, outside of his help, Father, we have no power against our enemies whatsoever. And Father, you've taught me years ago that my enemies are not always the, the people out there that don't like me, the people that hate me. Father, my enemies are some of my own making. The lust of my flesh. The lust of my eyes. And the pride of my life. Are afflictions that I have on me. And Father, you've never 
taken those away completely. I believe, Father, in the day when you're going to, when this flesh finally rests and rots in its tomb, and you separate my soul and my spirit to a new body, a new life, everlasting. That's when my afflictions will end. But Father, as hard as this might be for some people, help us, Father, to deal with our afflictions. Help us to live under them. Help us to understand, Father, what they are, why they're there. And Father, if, if Jesus can come and live here and commit no sin whatsoever and yet suffer affliction, who are we? So Father, just teach us tonight. Satisfy us. Give us, give us rest in our souls and comfort, Lord, and encouragement and knowing these things will befall us and they'll befall our friends and our neighbors and our brothers and sisters. And Father, as they're there for us to help us, Father, help us to be there for them. Bless and honor your word tonight. We love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, all God's people said, yeah, help me out here. Um, let me just read a couple of these that we've already gone over. Second Samuel twenty two twenty eight, and the afflicted people thou wilt save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. I've made mention of this before, and I really mean it. I've, I've been very thankful to God. There was a time in my life when none of you knew me. And I was very arrogant, very high-minded, very cocky. Uh, thought I knew it all, thought I could do it all thought I deserved more than what I was getting. When I look back on those days, it was a mess. And God used severe afflictions in my life to bring me down from that. And I actually was trying out for a church to be their youth minister back in their early 90s. And I had an interview with the pastor who I had known and met over the course of the years. And he was talking to me and he said, Mike, can I be real honest with you? And I said, sure. Tell, I was, you know, waiting for some good thing he was going to tell me. He said, Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. First time I met you, I saw you as a very cocky, arrogant, full of pride young man. And I went. Ah, you're crazy. In my mind, that's what I was thinking. But that man was dead right in his assessment of, you, of me. And God had to afflict me with something besides pride. I would rather be guilty of lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes than pride of life. Every day I would rather be guilty of that than to be guilty of pride because God resists the proud. He cannot they cannot stand in his presence. God will not allow it. God can take somebody who is sinful and break them and shake them and mold them in his image. But somebody who thinks they know it all, somebody who thinks they can do it all, somebody who thinks they don't need God, that God needs them, God has no use for them whatsoever. And God's reminded me of that more than once in my life. Now, Psalm 18, verse 27. Let me just read a few verses. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. And that fits exactly with what I just said. In fact, what I read here, the afflicted people thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. And so what God will do is, God will use afflictions to bring you down to humility, to bring you to a place where you realize you can't do it. You can't accomplish it. You're not who you think you are. And I had that problem. I had that same problem with pastors that I knew. I thought they were supermen. And I had one of them here. And I went to him and I asked him to preach on certain things for this church. And he looked at me, knew exactly what was going on in my mind? And he said, Mike, 
I am not who you think I am. I'd put this man on such a high pedestal that I thought, man, he can really turn this church over. And I was wrong and he knew it. He saw that in me and he told me flat out, Mike, I am not who you think I am. And I've never forgotten that and I've been very thankful that he was honest with me about that at that time. Psalm 22, 24. What is Psalm 22 about? Turn to Psalm 22, which just happens to be the 500th chapter of the Bible. Then number five is the number for grace, but it's also victory over death. What's in, number, what's in Psalm 22? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They part my garments, cast lots for my vesture. They pierce my hands and feet. It's a prediction of what was going to happen to Christ on the cross. And here it is, 500th chapter of the Bible. And he said in verse 24, For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. So when Jesus, this remember now, this is what it's about. It's about Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus is hanging there and he cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you think, you think God heard that? Absolutely. And God has not held against us the murder of his only begotten son. He used it for our grace and for our salvation. Amen, praise God. Psalm 25, verse 15. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Where did that net come from? In some cases, the devil laid a trap for you. Roy, the first time you took a drink, the devil had it set up. He had it set up. I'm going to get this guy and I'm going to ruin his life. Because I think. And I really do believe this. You, when you see, I see it in Moses. I see it at the time of Christ when he was born. I think the devil senses, like an animal will sense that something's not right going on around them. Their senses, their, their, maybe it's their hearing. Maybe it's their eyesight. Maybe it's their smell. But their senses, their senses are heightened because that's their survival. And I think the devil can sense a savior. I think the devil can sense in a child's life, this guy means something to God. I think I'm going to try to ruin him. So Roy, that first drink you ever took, how old were you? Ten. Ten. The devil set that up and laid a net for you to fall in. And when he did it, he said, I got him now. I got him for the rest of his life. God said, no, you don't, devil. You just think you do. By the way, the same net the devil laid for you, God's going to put the devil in that same net. That's what he says. Amen. Sometimes the net we, is what we cast out ourselves. We got tripped up in our own devices. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. And put those two words together. Because when we are afflicted, when, 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 I, when I was laying there with COVID, Matthew, I can tell you, there was a time I honestly thought I'm going to lose my mind. I'm just, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to go crazy. And there is, there has been studies done of people that have had COVID. It, it has altered their mind. But I thought I was going to lose it. Afraid I was going to die. Um, being in fear of that. Laying there for weeks, not being able to have church, much less even come to church. And it was hard to get through that. Ask me if I want it again. No way, no how. 
But in that affliction, I felt desolate. What have we learned about a person's life when there is desolation there, when there's a wilderness there? What have we learned? That's when the satyrs and that's when the dragons and that's when the owls and the, all the devils, that's when they show up because there is no man around. And I'll be honest with you. There wasn't hardly any day where I even felt like reading the Bible. That's how sick I was. All I did was lay there and try to make myself drink water. Try to read something out of the Bible every now and then. But man, I tell you what, I was hit hard. And some people had it worse than me. So he said in verse 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain and forgive all of my sins. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you. Can sins be an affliction too? Yes. They are thorns in your flesh. And they are an affliction that you have. Can God remove them? Of course. But if he leaves them in, he's doing it for a reason. And that reason he'll make known to you probably one day. And I've learned that finally when God removes one thorn, maybe the other one was there already and I just didn't notice it, but there's another one. Yep. Amen. That's why he said, forgive all my sins. Cons and and sometime, it, sometimes God will afflict you to remind you that, yes, there are sins that you have not repented of. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they that hate me with cruel hatred. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let, look at that. Look at that verse 20. Keep my soul. Your soul is not in your hands anymore. Remember when you got saved? You said, God, here, take this and hold on to this real tight. Don't lose it. For I know. What, how does that go? For I know and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day keep my soul and deliver me let me not be ashamed for i put my trust in thee let integrity and uprightness preserve me for i wait on thee something that i had to learn how to do when i got this church uh, i don't talk about it much because it's a very very hard time that the whole church went through. It was bad. But after things kind of settled down, I wanted all these people to start showing up. And I was going to introduce programs. And I was going to do this. And I was going to do that. And I, was, I had in my mind all these things that I was going to do to achieve success in bringing people into the church. And I was going to, I, I'm not kidding you, show you how dumb I was was I thought I'm going to be the pastor that everybody likes. Don't you laugh, Gary. That's never happened. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. So you know what I had to learn how to do? I had to learn how to wait on God. When I... Um, Matthew, this was before you were born. When we were at Rich Woods, and I felt like God was leading me from there to come back here, we did. And the church had a new pastor, and he made a lot of promises and so on. And he said, Michael, I'm going to bring you in. You'll be like an assistant pastor. We have to provide for your salary somehow. And so we were thinking about a school and a daycare. And I... And I was trying to do everything I could to make that happen so I could get out of working in construction 
and get here full time. And every, everything I tried failed. Everything that he tried failed. It wasn't time. It wasn't time. It wasn't time. It wasn't time. And I, I was just on the altar, just bawling my eyes out, crying, God, when are you going to do this? Finally, when it was time, God started doing it. And I had to learn how to wait on God to do what he's going to do. You learn how to do that, you'll be a lot happier in life. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. What did Jesus tell the disciples to do in Acts chapter 1? Go back to the upper room and wait. He did not say do this so the Holy Spirit come down. He just said wait. I'll send the Holy Spirit when I'm ready to send the Holy Spirit. That's how God does it. And you will hear people tell you, well, God's waiting for you to make the first step. You must take a leap of faith. God's waiting on you to do this. No, 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 no. He never says that. He tells you to wait. And I've learned the value. I've tried to get ahead of the Lord several times and probably still do it from time to time. But God says, wait, 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 wait. I'll perform it. That way, when I perform it, you'll give me the praise for it because you know it wasn't you. And we have 100,000 people in Kenya listening to us. And I didn't do that. God did that because I waited on Him. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. Redeem, O Israel, O God, out of all of His troubles. Psalm 25, 18. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Um, look, yeah, here he says it again. Look upon mine affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. He's connecting affliction and pain with sin. It's going to happen. You're going to sin and God will afflict you and will cause pain in your life to remind you of that. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now, when does he do it? It may take death. But let's stop trying to think of death as the worst thing that can happen to a saint. Keith moved his wife Pam down here because he knew he was going to die. And he knew, Roy, that he wasn't going to leave his wife up there in the middle of nowhere with no one to help take care of her. When he told me that, I'm just like, that is a godly man right there. For God, for him to listen to God, because he said God told him to do it. God said, now that you got your house here where you want it, you got everything you want, what are you going to do? Die and leave, leave your wife up here all by herself? And he gave up everything that he had built and dreamed of to bring his wife down here. And sure enough, that's what happened. But was that the worst thing to ever happen to Keith? No. It's the best thing. Sister Linda Toomey, who fought all of those health issues, all her, ever since we've known her, best thing to happen to her is to go home. And I know it hurts. It hurts to see our loved ones die. But if they're in the Lord, that's God delivering them out of all of their afflictions. And we need to see it that way. Psalm 44, 24. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? Because that's what we think when we are being afflicted. We think God has forgot about us. Psalm 107, 17. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. You will be, you'll be afflicted for doing stupid stuff. Amen. Psalm 116, 10, I believe, therefore have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. Psalm 119, and see that verse right there, you will never hear Joyce Myers or Joel Osteen read the other half of that verse. 
The first half says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. And they use that to push their case that if you just speak it and believe it, God brings it into action. But then he said, I was greatly afflicted. You never hear them read that, ever. Because that's a negative confession in their, believe it or not, they will not say things like that even if they're reading scripture because they say it's a negative confession and if you say it then Gary you will cause the afflictions to happen because you spoke it Psalm 11950 this is my comfort in my affliction for thy word hath quickened me best thing to do when you are being afflicted get your Bible out I'm not saying God will immediately heal you but he'll sure make you feel better before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Psalm 1971, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Again, these are verses that the name it, claim it, health people will not read to you. They do not want you to see these verses out of the Bible. David saying, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Of course it is. And I remember reading that one day going, God, thank you for that. I needed that. And I remembered that one night. I come down, I got started getting sick and it was cold outside and I spent too much time doing some things out in the cold. And I come in here and my wife, man, I tell you what, I've almost passed out. Because I had pneumonia, didn't know it. I was outside breathing all that cold air and it was just making me sick. Got me over to the ER. I just about collapsed on them over there. Couldn't hardly breathe. And while I'm laying there, they bring another, some old woman, I think, and her daughter, who was probably older than me, into another part and it was just separated by a curtain. And I could hear them over there crying. And I'm laying there just, I feel awful. And I said, ladies, can I pray for y'all? And they went, you sure can. And I led those two ladies in prayer. I've never seen them since. I don't know where they are, what they are. But I prayed that God would make himself real to them, that God would give them healing, that God would give them salvation. I mean, I prayed the whole works on them. Here I am laying there sick as a dog. I needed to be there. And at the time, God was dealing with me about things in my life. And I needed that. Psalm 119, 107, I'm afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Psalm 129, many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. Yet they have not prevailed against me. Many times. You're going to get, so Jr. you're kind of growing up there and getting ready to get out on your own. Callie's going to be following you soon. Mama's going to cry a lot. Yeah. You're going to find out that this world is full of dangers, nets, traps sins and the devil will fiery dart you to death god can use every bit of that even your own failures to teach you how to grow to be a godly man am i right dad your dad said i was right thank god he is Isaiah 30, amen, me too. Isaiah 30, verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, who gave it to you? The Lord did. And I, and I thought these guys said that if you have affliction, that's, that's because Satan is ruling your life. No, it isn't. God gave it to you. The Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. And when you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left, 
And you shall defile also the covering of the graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, and thou shalt sow the ground withal, and the bread of the increase of the earth. And it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall the cattle feed in large pastures. He's telling you, there is no blessings without affliction. In fact, the afflictions make the blessings a much greater blessing. You appreciate them more when you have the afflictions. Like my grandparents living during the Depression. She didn't throw out one tablespoon of corn. That was saved and ate for lunch the next day. Why? Because they knew the value of one penny. The value of half a can of corn. The value of what you have, you don't squander, you don't throw away. And my grandma's, grandpa's house, and they lived in a nice little neighborhood and they lived comfortable. But they didn't have tons of stuff that they never needed. They just had enough to live a simple, comfortable life on and that was it. And they were very happy people. But they went through hard times. And they saw the value of God blessing them during that time. I'm going to quit here in a minute. Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Take, if you're, if, open your Bible up to Isaiah 48, 10. And when you think of furnace, think of a story with a furnace in it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's one of them. Isaiah 48. And you write these places down. Because they're linked. Isaiah 48, 10. Link it with um, Daniel 3, 3, 25. Shadrach, Meshach, and the fourth is the Son of God. Fiery furnace. Number two. Link it with 1 Peter, chapter 1. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, though it be tried with fire may be found unto honor and praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, think it not a strange thing, I think that's verse 12, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try thee, as so, though some strange thing happen unto you. And then, write this one down. Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, out as the smoke of a great furnace. I think all of those are linked together. Okay? I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. What did God say about his word in Psalm 12? The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You want God to do the same thing with your life? Then yes, he will purify you through the furnace of earth. And he will, he will get all the dross out of your life. And in doing that, He's going to preserve you so that you never have to worry about where you're going to spend eternity. You'll know it. Amen? So the, let the adversity happen. Let God do it. Let God send it your way. Don't try to fight it off. And let God teach you and train you how to pray your way through it. How to grab your Bible and hold on to it through it. How to study thy precepts through it. How to, how to share then with others what you've been through because of it. You know, Roy's not the only one here that's got a sin testimony to share with other people. He's just the only one that has told everybody what his biggest sin was. 
or at least I think his biggest sin. There's some things he hasn't told you, but that when he shares, and that's his testimony. Hey, I was just like you. Let me tell you what God did for me. He's not the only one in this church that can have one of those. Amen.